it is time for us to tell the truth about the Georgia Bulldogs. Tonight, you strap in, because I don't know where this is going. I don't know. I have an idea of some things I want to say. There are some things I want to touch on. There are some things that I feel have to be addressed, but I'm not going to let the rundown constrain me tonight. This could go long. It could go not as long as maybe it otherwise would have. But the bottom line is, we're going to tell the truth from where I sit about the Georgia Bulldogs tonight. And if you're going to tell the truth, then you have to start at the beginning of the story. And seeing as how we just came off a of victory to improve to 3-0, and keep in mind that the Georgia Bulldogs are 3-0, and they've won 42 consecutive regular season games. They've won 28, I believe the number is, consecutive regular season SEC games. Some people are going to listen to any and everything I say tonight and tell you that I'm overreacting or that I am somehow off the mark or don't know what I'm talking about. So be it. <clears throat> we all look at it a different way. But the one thing about football, maybe more than any other sport, is that there's a saying when you're in and around the game. And that saying is, the eye in the sky, it don't lie. Not once, not ever. And if you know what you're looking for when you watch the tape, you can learn an awful lot. It will tell you everything you need to know about where you need to get better. It'll tell you about who's giving the right kind of effort. It will tell you and inform you on a good path forward if you know what you're looking for. Now, let me preface everything else that comes after what I just said by saying this. I have never sat in this chair and told you that I am some film breakdown guru, okay? There are a lot of people out there who are going to tell you that. Some of them are just flat lying to you, and then there are those who actually know what they're doing. I'm going to let you decide who you want to pay attention to. But I know for a fact that there are people who come into your YouTube world, just like I'm here tonight, and they're going to sit there staring the camera and make you believe that they know what they're talking about. Meanwhile, those clips get sent over to the coaches at the uh, University of Georgia offices, and they're like, what in the hell is this jackleg talking about? He has no clue what he's saying. I only say that to tell you I'm not that dude, and I'm not telling you that I know anything any more than somebody who's been around the game for a minute might know. But here's what I can tell you. Here's what I bring to the table that's a little bit different than a lot of folks out here. And understand, there are people who do that job really well, okay? Some of them have been on this show. Some of them I've recommended to you in the past. I'm just not that guy because I don't want to be that guy. That's not where I want to put my attention. Doesn't mean I didn't know how to watch film, though. What I do bring to the table is I'm a guy that has sat in the room with NFL head coaches, with college head coaches, with offensive and defensive coordinators, with NFL superstars, okay? Does it rub off? Is it osmosis? Do I automatically know everything they know? No, but I know what to look for if we're watching film, okay? If we're going back and looking at the tape, I know it. So here's the thing. Again, I'm not that tape guy. I'm just saying all that to say that when I go back and look at the tape, there are things I see, all right? It just informs what I'm about to share with you. And like I said, Georgia's 3-0, and 42 consecutive regular season victories. It's not like this is a bad football team. But the reason I said I don't know where this is going tonight is you can ask Anybody that I've talked to over the last four or five days, especially my Alabama friends who, you know, we play them in, a, in just a few days. And I just, I can't help it. I just talk football. I don't talk to, <clears throat> you know, trash talk or any of that other stuff. That is never my intention. All I'm trying to do is just talk about the game the way I see it. And I do that about my team, too. 
And honestly, there are people out there who are going to tell you that uh, I need to like step away from the ledge because I know enough to know that the way Georgia played, even in a victory on Saturday, didn't make me feel very good this week. It probably didn't make a lot of y'all feel very good this week. Thankful for the win. But, you know, we've had happier Mondays, I would say. So let's just start at the beginning. Got fired up right there. Just bear with me, because I told you, I don't know where we're going tonight. This might be a great episode. It might be an awful one. But we're in it now. So here we go. Let's start with just my blunt treetop opinions about what we saw at Kentucky. And the one thing I want to make very clear is that I told you from this chair that Kentucky had a good defense, that they had NFL players on that defense, that the culture of that program is one that's going to help you see why they're a good defense. It, it, it underpins everything. They play hard, right? They have good athletes. They may not have as many athletes as, say, a roster like Georgia or Ohio State does, but I told you that was going to be a tough defense. It would have been tough if Georgia had beaten South Carolina 28-7, to okay? That's not how that game went against South Carolina. The offense turned the ball over, presented with some short fields for South Carolina. They took advantage of that. The score got away from Kentucky. We all know how it shook out in the end. Then Georgia sat here for a whole week. I sat here and listened to all the Georgia fans tell me about how that game was going to be a 50-3 to blowout. And all they saw and heard, if you're the team, the outside noise was, Kentucky's trash. Don't worry about it. Right? They, we don't want to believe that they're going to be impacted that way. We want to believe that the systems and the superstructure that's in place at the University of Georgia blocks all that out. But we know that's not true. I know it's not true. These young men interact with my social media posts on the regular. I know they see it. Now, it's not my responsibility to make them focus or be more honed in than maybe they would be otherwise. That's their business. That's their job. My job is to talk about it and show you guys fun stuff and share in the joy of being a Georgia Bulldog fan. But it's ridiculous to think that maybe they weren't impacted in some way. And even if they weren't impacted by what they were hearing outside the program in the run-up to this Kentucky game, let's say that didn't happen at all, you still are dealing with a bunch of men that are between the ages of, say, 17 or 18 and, I don't know, 24. <clears throat> That's half my age. I remember what it was like to be that age, and I know that you never have the same football team Saturday to Saturday inside college football, regardless of who you are, which program you represent, or how good your head coach is, or how many stars are beside your name. It does not work that way. I watched Alabama teams escape time and time again. I watched Florida teams with Tim Tebow almost lose to Vanderbilt on the road, lose to a bad Mississippi team at home. It's just the nature of the sport and of the age of the people playing it. But even if you move beyond all of those things, you get down to the nuts and bolts of what happened in the game. And that was that the University of Georgia, over the course of three games, continues to be, at least according to the numbers that we can measure, a less disciplined unit than they've been in the past. How do I know? Because they're averaging 8.3 penalties per game, way above what we're used to in the Kirby Smart era. I'll talk about that more a little bit later. We also know that Georgia went into Kentucky, and everybody wants to think that because you have a roster that somebody in a room somewhere told you was the best in the nation, I relay that information. Again, we measure these things. But just because there's a four or a five-star beside someone's name, 
The, the casual line is, especially when you're a cocky George Bulldog fan who's won back-to-back -back national championships inside the last three years, who's won 42 consecutive games, you're like, man, we were great. We got plenty of players. Plug and play. Okay. Plug and play. But then they leave off the other part where they expect those dudes to be as good as the dudes that they're replacing. They're not going to be. I don't care what's beside their name. If they were as good as those dudes, they would have been playing. And Georgia went into Kentucky with a defensive line that at the end of the day had three, three players play 50-plus snaps. I think Kentucky had something like 72 or 75 total snaps in the game, offensive snaps. You had three defensive linemen that played 50-plus. One of them wasn't even expecting to play, and he did that kind of work. If any one of those guys had gone down Sunday night, Georgia would have been in a world of hurt. Where did Kentucky attack Georgia? In the middle. Straight ahead runs. They ran right at them. Why? Because Georgia is a fast defense. They knew they couldn't run sideline to sideline. They knew they couldn't protect against the pass rush for long periods of time. They ran right at Georgia. Why? Because it's A, their best option. B, they knew that Georgia was thin there. And even when we're not talking about being thin, go back and look at the tape. There were freshmen all over that field, not redshirt freshmen, not sophomores that just haven't played a lot, right? More physically mature bodies. We're talking about true freshmen all over that field. And they are five-star players. And they will be great football players for the University of Georgia. Right now, that's a very tall order. Physically, it's a very tall order. Not to mention that they don't know everything that they need to know. Not to mention that they're not used to being the guy that's being depended on. That's a different animal. Just because you know how to play the game... If you hadn't been the man, you don't know how to be the man. And if you do have that rare bird that's able to do that, that's a true unicorn, okay? And defensively, it's hard because somebody's punching you in the face every play. You get lazy. Man, this was hard. This isn't like high school. Now, I'm not making excuses. This is what happened. If you want to know what happened, that's what happened. And at the end of the day, that defense was still good enough to make the plays that they had to make to win the game. Now, let's get back to these 30,000-foot view uh, opinions of Kentucky. Kentucky came into that game embarrassed and pissed off, and you could tell it from the first snap of the game, the way they attacked Georgia's blockers, the way they just were frothing at the mouth to get a piece of that block destruction, anything that was swung out wide, those dudes were fired out of a cannon attacking those uh, blockers in space. And good on them. You do not have a week like Kentucky had if you got anything about you at all and consider yourself a football player and then show up the next Saturday and not want to knock somebody's nose in the dirt, all right? You got blood in your eyes. You're going to get after somebody. You might lose. You might get penalized and thrown out of the game, but you are about to get after somebody. And that's what Kentucky did against Georgia, not to mention that they're the number one team in the land, not to mention that they were at home, and they were literally fighting for their lives in terms of what their fan base was going to do for them the rest of the season. They had to earn that fan base's respect to keep them coming to the games. You guys might not have listened to all the Kentucky fans in the lead up to the game. I sure did. I do that. It's in my DNA. I go listen to all the press conferences. 
I go pay attention to, to as many opposing teams, uh, sources of information as I possibly can. And I'm telling you, they, were, they had already quit on that Kentucky team. But Kentucky showed up and fought, which is what you should expect them to do. Now, <clears throat> what else did we see? Carson Beck showed me a lot of things. Some bad. Some good. We'll dive into that just a little bit more here in a minute. The offensive line showed me a lot. And there sure wasn't a lot of good there. You came out of, I don't say you, I came out of this Kentucky game with serious doubts about everything that we thought we knew about this team moving forward. Best offensive line in the country. They did not play like a unit that was consisted or made up of all Americans, returning starters. They didn't play that way. They played sloppy. Sloppy is not a strong enough word. They were just, it, it was, it was ugly. That's the kind of film performance you go, you sit in the room and somebody points out to you all the mistakes you made completely whiffing on block after block. Offensive linemen going in the in opposite directions from one another. Busting assignments, free runners to the quarterback. It was bad. The eye in the sky don't lie. And Georgia couldn't seem to block anybody anywhere. They couldn't block in perimeter. They couldn't block with the tight ends. The all line, the offensive linemen had a hard time. They didn't seem to know what they were doing. And part of that's being on the road. But Think for a second what I just said. This is a group that was favored to win the Joe Moore Award, okay? Veterans, all Americans, they've been on the road in the SEC before. Yeah, it was probably loud at Kentucky. But when you've got a second-year starting quarterback in there, when you've got a line that's supposed to know what they're doing, you would expect that at least, you know, they're not going to look as bad as they looked. You might have an occasional bust, but not as consistently Busting assignment after assignment the way this offensive line did last week. Listen, everybody has an off week. It just seemed everybody along that line had an off night on the same night this last week. Except for one guy, the one guy that you might think was going to have a really rough time at Kentucky, his first SEC start on the road, Jared Wilson, the center. He played really well. He did a really good job. I'm not saying he played perfect, but he sure had one of the cleanest nights from what I could see. There's a lot to give you some alarm if you're a Georgia Bulldogs fan from watching that game. Now, this is just me running on, but like I said, we're talking about getting to the truth. And if we're going to do that, Let's start with the good, or at least the better. Let's go ahead and pick it up with the defense. Let's talk about the performance of that defense and what they did. You guys know that every week I do the beasts of the week, where I come out and I talk about who had the best performance in any given week, you know, and let you know why I chose them. I haven't even shared my beasts of the week this week because I'm still thinking about it, right? Because I, my big thing was I want to give it to the entire defense because at the end of the day, they made the plays necessary to help Georgia win this game. And in fairness, the offense did too. They had to make a play here or there, and they did. But the reason Georgia won this game was because of the defense and the way they played all night long. Let's think about what this defense has done so far. They haven't given up a touchdown in four games. That's three games this year and then the Florida State game. They're allowing six points a game. And they're flying all over the field looking pretty nasty, even with a bunch of young guys. There are a few. We've already addressed the fact that they were shorthanded. Three defensive linemen played 50-plus snaps. That means you had youth and inexperience all over the field. And yet, the leadership that we saw from the players that did have experience 
And more than leadership, just the raw playmaking ability to make a play when they needed to do it, that was impressive. But how was it that Kentucky kept the ball away from Georgia? How was it that they limited opportunities, dominated time of possession? Georgia helped them. Going back to my point about how undisciplined this team appears according to the metrics. Now, we can all point and say, well, that shouldn't have been a penalty or that should not have been a penalty. I don't care. They called it a penalty. It was part of the game. And in at least three different occasions, Georgia committed penalties on defense on third down, which kept drives alive and left Kentucky on the field. In a game with the new clock rules and playing an opponent that obviously feels like they have to run the football to have a chance in the game, they have to possess it, you just don't have as many opportunities offensively. And when you gift them drive extenders the way the dogs did on several occasions, you end up getting a game that looks a lot like what we saw, which puts stress on those interior defensive linemen that had to play 50-plus. Because remember, Georgia's game is to rotate those players in. When they're at their best, Georgia is able to keep player snap numbers, you know, 20 to 30, maybe, along that interior defensive line. They had 50 plus, three different guys. That leads to things. You start to get tired. But then you also just have to throw in there a big old helping of Georgia didn't play well even on defense, even making the plays they needed to make. How do we know? Because they missed 16 tackles, 16. Now, I didn't do the research to go back and try to find out How long it's been since Georgia has clearly missed 16 tackles. That's not even counting the ones that maybe was a missed tackle. That's straight up misses. So, yeah, they didn't play great either. Part of that was probably fatigue. Part of it was youth and inexperience. Part of it was the guys, like I said, not being used to being the man, being the one being counted on. They allowed 170 yards rushing in total. To Kentucky, a team that was one-dimensional, essentially, and doesn't have a game-breaking back at the running back position. And yet, because of the way the game played out, Georgia was able to dictate situationally what Kentucky was forced to do in the second half and tilted the board to their advantage and then made the plays that they needed to make to win the game. So let's put a little bit of a spotlight on a few of the people that I want to mention here on this defense that did a good job. You were just looking at one of them, Jalen Walker, in the backfield all the time. Unblockable, it seemed. He even said as much in the the behind-the-scenes reel that the university put out. He's like, they can't block me if they tried. They don't want anymore they cannot block me and he was not lying he didn't finish with multiple sacks or multiple tackles for loss but he absolutely was a game wrecker for the dogs a leader a playmaker when they needed it most on saturday against kentucky but then you have a guy like tid tyrian ingram dawkins stock up I mentioned this to you last week. The only thing that has kept this young man from being a big-time player at the University of Georgia was maturity, but even more than that, injury. He seems to, by all accounts, have gotten the maturity part under control. He knows what's expected of him and what's required if he wants to achieve his goals. And now he's healthy. And when you have those two things put together with a little drive, good coaching, good game plan, you start to see a player have an impact on the game the way TID did against Kentucky, resulting in co-defensive line player of the week. All over Brock Vandegrift all night, pushing the pocket, playing the run game, moving sideline to sideline, completely disrupting what Kentucky was trying to do in the pass game. 
Very impressive. Like I said, Jalen Walker was an absolute monster. He had eight total pressures in the game. All over Brock Vandegrift. Who else? Raylan Wilson, co-defensive player of the week. You're like, why Raylan and not Jalen? Well, Raylan actually had the numbers, right? The statistics. And if you're splitting hairs inside the league office, this is what it comes down to. Who had the better stats? Well, this night, it was Raylan. He had the sack, forced fumble, multiple other tackles, flying all over the field. He's just stacking days and weeks right now at becoming a better and better player. It's great to see. And it's also great to see that he's not alone. This is a guy, I don't know, you can't really see his number. And unless you are a diehard dog fan, you probably don't even know who that is. But that's Gabe Harris, for those who can't see the screen. Highly touted. I believe he may have been a five-star in some of the rankings. Certainly a four-star player. Great pass rushing skill set. But I mentioned this a little while back. The thing that I've been impressed with, with uh, from Gabe is the way his body looks. Like he's transformed his body. He's no longer a skinny high school kid. He's put on some really, really good weight, muscle mass, and he is playing with a nastiness that I really, really like. And then we saw against Kentucky on Saturday, another guy, he only had 17 total snaps. Four of those were quarterback pressures and pass rush situations, and one of those was a sack. Gabe Harris is going to become a dominant player for the University of Georgia. I'm thinking before this year is over. If you don't know him, get to know him. He's certainly wearing a number that would get your attention. He's wearing 29. Do you remember the last big-time defensive player that wore 29 for the Dogs? His name was Jarvis Jones, All-American. Watch Gabe Harris. But he's not alone. Here's another guy that people have been wondering where he's at. Damon Wilson, another guy who revamped his body. Completely different dude than we saw last year. If you go on Google, search up a couple of different pictures here, find a side-by-side of Damon last year and Damon this year, and see who's been putting in work in the offseason. Who is taking care of his body? Who is at the University of Georgia on a mission to be the best football player he can be, this guy would be the picture that's right beside that definition of the example. And he's showing up in games. Adding to the havoc factor that Georgia's pass rushers are creating. Filling in because Michael was out injured. Remember, one of the best defensive players in the country was not on the field for Georgia. Who's getting those snaps? Gabe Harris, Damon Wilson. They can trust them, and they know what to do, and they're showing up and playing well, and they are part of the reason that Georgia has not allowed a touchdown yet this year. Think back to my season preview series. I said the thing Georgia better get better at is red zone defense because last year they were horrid. So far, it looks like they're taking that serious. Jalen Walker, Raylan Wilson, C.J. Allen, who I'm not even talking about, Gabe Harris, Damon Wilson. These guys are taking that seriously, and it's showing up so far this year. Not pictured, but another name I want to mention here is Julian Humphrey. Everybody's been worried about the secondary for the dogs so far. Who's it going to be? They're young, inexperienced, so on and so forth. Well, you know Malachi's back there. You know Dan Jackson's back there. You know Everett's got one of the corners. Humphrey has locked down that other corner. Just, that's it. The story's over. He's locked it down. Aguero at star. If he's healthy, he's the guy there. We saw against Clemson, they can move pieces around if they have to. But that group that's in the back end right now, that is a group that deserves some respect. And people who don't know about them are going to learn. Now, they're going to get tested when Georgia goes to Tuscaloosa. There's no two ways about that. And I'll tell you why here in just a minute. 
But I think they're up to the challenge. They certainly have played well up to this point. So, yeah, there were some bad defensively. The missed tackles, the youth and inexperience, the lack of depth due to injury, all very real things. But there was a lot of good for the dogs defensively. Like I said, that's the reason they won the game at the end of the day, in my opinion. But let's talk about the offense. Carson Beck and an offense that was full of weapons, supposedly, an offense that I expected to average 400 yards a game and close to 40 points a game. Now, it's a long season. They still might make those marks. But that is not the team that showed up in Lexington Saturday. Part of that has to do with who and what Kentucky did, who they are and what they did and how they did it. So credit to Kentucky where it's deserved. And then from there, it gets real ugly. And because we're looking at Carson here on the screen, I want to talk about him specifically. You are already hearing people who, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm saying this was something that I was talking about back in the summer. Is he good when things are good and not so good when the going gets tough? Or is he the leader that's going to step up and will Georgia to victory, put the team on his shoulders if they need him? We don't know until you go play these games. Because in the offseason, Carson told everybody, yeah, I'm that dude now. The team seems to respect him. His coaches back that up as far as the leadership that they've seen from him. He has all of the physical tools to do exactly that. Be that dude. And I asked him to his face, are you that dude? And he said, yeah. And then Kentucky happens. In your estimation, did Carson rise to the challenge? Did he lead his team when he had to, to get the points necessary to win the game? Do you give him credit for that? He did a lot of good things, and he does a lot of good things every week at the line of scrimmage. It's just something to ponder. I bring it up because it's something that we spent the offseason talking about. Georgia got the win. They had to drive the football to do it. You can make your own assessment. But pulling back from that broad view... Carson didn't play great against Kentucky. I would argue that he didn't play great most of the game. But when it mattered, he made throws and he led his team. And Georgia got the score they needed to win the game. They don't ask you how, they ask you how many. Chalk that one up as another victory for Carson Beck. But like I said, for the most part of the game, he didn't play well. In fact, I was so put off by how poorly he played when I watched the game back again. It reminded me of what we saw against South Carolina last year, which really, that's the part that caught me off guard. This is a dude in year two with his coordinator for a second year who works really hard at becoming as good as he can be at his job. And yet, against Kentucky, it looked like Carson was showing those same issues that he showed against South Carolina, which was he looked hurried. He looked rushed, like snap, read, and he bounced through his progression so quickly that he didn't give the time play enough to develop. And then he would wind up dumping the ball for no gain or small gain or or something like that. Or he was missing reads. And I don't mean he's making bad throws. I'm saying he's missing, like not seeing the reads. There were multiple occasions where he had deep shots that were there for him to take. 
but he didn't see them because his clock was sped up, his feet were piss poor, and he just couldn't deliver the ball. That's the kind of thing that I didn't expect I was going to see from Carson Beck here in year two. Frankly, I have no explanation for it. It's not a coaching thing. It's not something that we've seen from Carson against Clemson necessarily, certainly not against Tennessee Tech. And Kentucky wasn't all over him. But see, that brings us right back to the poor performance of the offensive line. When you get hit the way Carson got hit the other night on plays where guys were coming free due to busted assignments, that's going to speed your clock up. So is it Carson overall? Or was it Carson just being shaken in that game because his offensive line was playing so poorly? Because he didn't have the advantage of a run game in the first half. None of these things happen in a silo. It all fits together. But the part that I didn't enjoy from Carson was just how antsy he looked. When he's on platform and in time, he is as impressive as any quarterback you're going to see. The pass he ripped off to Dylan Bell on second 20, right over the middle with a man draped all over 86. Phenomenal throw. Like, top shelf but then in the same game he's missing wide receivers running wide open it's never as good or as bad as we think it is it's always somewhere in the middle so rest assured that the way Carson performed against Kentucky had a lot to do with how his offensive line was performing the fact that he didn't have a run game so I'm not throwing Carson out with the bathwater here. But I want to see him find his vision, maintain his mechanics, and then have that confidence to just let it rip the way he did on that ball to Dylan Bell. If the shot is there, all things being equal, hang it up down the sideline to Arian Smith. Give your guys a chance to make a play. Believe that they're going to do it for you. Some of these things just have to be built over the course of the season. So I'm not giving up on Carson Beck yet. At the end of the day, I think he did what he needed to do to get the job done. But it was not pretty. And again, in large part, that's because of what we saw in the blocking from the dogs on Saturday night. And what's more than that, let's talk, let's call names along that offensive line. All the guys that were up for All American, like Dylan Fairchild, Ernest Green, Xavier Truss, Micah Morris, all of them had bad tape on Saturday. Completely whiffing on linebackers. Stepping the wrong way. Literally looking lost in the middle of the offensive line. Think about Branson Robinson's touchdown run. He had a man right in the gap, squared up in front of him, just Branson and the defensive lineman, because our interior lineman got beat on a stunt, and then Branson put it in the end zone anyway. Speaks to his talent. I have a little bit more to say about that here in a second. But that offensive line has to get better. The blocking in every phase has to get better. On the perimeter, from the tight ends, along the offensive line. The flip side of that coin, and again, it's never as good or as bad as it looks, is that there were multiple opportunities for the Georgia Bulldogs to hit game-changing, explosive offensive plays, both in the run game and in the pass game on Saturday night against Kentucky. But one part of the machine falters, and then the whole thing comes apart. You're losing a wheel in the ditch, and it turns into an absolute wreck. Limited possessions, and then you end up 
with a low-scoring football game. The one bright star I do want to take just a quick second and point out here is, is like I told you, every time Georgia steps on the field this season, they should absolutely have the advantage in the special teams areas of football. Kicking game, kick coverage, punt game, punt coverage. Georgia was dominant again against Kentucky. And in a game like this, it absolutely matters. So kudos to the special teams units. What else? What else do we want to talk about? Let's 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 talk about the running backs. We talked about Carson Beck and what he did. Let's talk about Trevor Etienne. Undeniable that Trevor Etienne's got that bounce. He's got that juice. And given half an inch, he was going to change the game for Georgia on Saturday. Wonderful time and again at creating something out of nothing. You need to make sure that one is getting the ball. If he's healthy, he's the guy. And then you rotate him in with what I think will be a phenomenal pairing. And don't forget to include Branson Robinson in this mix. Who put it in the house when you had to have it? 22 did. ETN had gotten them all the way down the field, was winded, needed a break. No problem. Put 22 in there. What do you see? Man in his face in the hole. He knows he has to score. Crazy jump cut and vision and then powers his way into the end zone. Yeah, 22's healthy. He's a little angry. And if the offensive line and the outside guys can do their jobs, put a hat on a hat and stick on them, block somebody like they care about it, these two guys are going to make Georgia right. Because once you get any kind of a run game that I think they you know can have here, that play action game opens up, Carson becomes a different player, those wide receivers, that man-to-man straight up may not be able to win every time they step on the field, get that extra half second, that extra half step because of the play action game. And now the window's open and the ball goes down the field. Trevor Etienne and Branson Robinson are a pairing that must carry the load for Georgia. Everything starts with the offensive line. The running back position and their production becomes 1A. Now, I'm not talking about Frazier here right now, Nate Frazier, not because I don't think the kid's a player. He's absolutely a player. But he's also absolutely a freshman. How do we know? Because he does freshman things. Two carries inside the 10-yard line against Kentucky. What does he do with the first one? Puts his head down, foot in the ground, gets up the field, four or five-yard gain, awesome. They give it to him again, similar play call, and high school takes over. He thinks he's the fastest dude on the field. My instinct is to bounce it, run sideways, loses five yards, and now what you thought was absolutely going to be a touchdown for the dogs ends up being another field goal. ETN and Robinson are the guys in that order. They have to get that run game going. That offensive line has to play better. And if they do, all this other stuff is going to work itself out. Because we're moving on. The season continues. And we're on a bye week this week. But when they come back, the dogs are on the road again inside conference, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, to take on the Crimson Tide. And I told you people, my friends, my community, all in the offseason, all over the course of the summer, that fair or not, this game is going to be a referendum, not only on Kirby Smart, but on the University of Georgia football program. To hell with the fact that they've won 42 consecutive regular season games. If the dogs go to Tuscaloosa and lose, we're going to feel a way None of us want to feel. We're going to feel a way that, frankly, we probably won't have felt since Tennessee in 2016. Right? 
We're a team that you desperately want to beat because, you know, they're a big boy inside the conference. Beats you in a way that just rips the carpet out from underneath you. That's how dog fans are going to feel if they lose this game. And holy hell, what will the media firestorm be? Not that it matters, especially not in terms of a 12-team playoff, but this will absolutely be a referendum on Kirby Smart and his football program. Just because of who the opponent is, fair or not, that's the way it's going to go down. Do you think it's not a big game? Then you are not really paying attention to what college football is. Not right now. The thing about the Kentucky game, the positive to take away from that is that Georgia, when it came down to it, expected to win the game. That's how you win 42 in a row. They did what they had to do to win the game. When they had to do it, the offensive line got it right on a play or two here or there. ETN made a play here or there because of his talent. They moved the ball down the field, and when everything was on the line, Even later in the fourth quarter, Mike Bobo made a hell of a football call. Carson made a hell of a throw. Dominic Lovett on the sell route on second down and nine to not only move the ball down the field, but maintain possession for the dogs and give them an opportunity to pretty much end the game. Now, I could go back and rehash what the defense did, but that's how it wound up. When they had to, they did what they had to do. They expected to win because they've been in the position to win. Now they're expected to go on the road to Alabama and win. They've got the bye week to get right, improving, hopefully healing up a little bit. Because what is in Tuscaloosa is no easy task. Jalen Milrow, waiting on the dogs. 1-0 against Carson Beck. 1-0 against the Georgia Bulldogs. SEC champion. Welcoming Kirby Smart, Carson Beck, and the rest of the Bulldogs into his house. Coming off a performance where we saw Milrow attack Wisconsin both with his arm Beautiful touchdown passes on the day, as well as with his legs. Touchdown runs. I think he had two. Two touchdown passes. Three touchdown runs. I forget the exact breakdown. He had a huge day. We know what he did against Georgia last year in the NCC championship game. He doesn't have to run crazy, but he's making enough plays when his team needs it to make the difference in the game. Now, the Alabama people are going to tell you, listen, we've got our own issues. We are really, you know, boom or bust. We're going to throw the ball down the field. It's either going to be a big play or it's not going to be a good play, right? One of my friends says, yeah, we're not driving the football right now, and that's going to come back to hurt us. We'll see, especially against what this Georgia defense has shown us, that they have the ability to make good teams drive the field. If that's the kind of game this turns into, then maybe the dogs are in pretty good shape. I'm not going to talk about making a pick tonight or anything else. We still got a whole other week to worry about Alabama. This is like the worst two weeks of my life, especially coming off a performance that we just had against Kentucky. The struggle is real. I have already made my season predictions, and I said Georgia was going to go into Alabama and win this game. And now we've got a body of work to look at and it forces you to reassess the situation. Yeah. We'll get all to all the picks and all that stuff next week. But anyway, you cut it. Georgia's got a tall task when they go to Tuscaloosa. That Alabama team is going to be ready. We just have to hope, as Georgia football fans, that Kirby Smart 
and Carson Beck and that offensive line and everybody else, the defense as a unit, that they're all going to do the things necessary that they need to do to be ready to go by the time they kick this thing off at 730 in about a week and a half. Biggest game of the year so far. Hands down, in my opinion. We think we know a little something about other teams that have been involved in so-called big games so far, right? Florida State, nothing to worry about there. Michigan, fraudulent. Texas win over Michigan. What can you make of it? Michigan's a bunch of frauds right now. Clemson, we'll see. I know Clemson plays really good defense. I know that much. Hands down, the biggest game of the year so far. And I just think that everything that we know about the DNA of this team should give us heart and belief that Kirby and these boys are going to be ready to go. They're saying the right things. This week, the word out of Athens, we're just worried about us. Of course, journalists have to ask the question, what do you think about Alabama? Jalen Walker, Mr. Havoc himself, he went so far as to say, man, I cannot wait until next week when I get to focus on Alabama. Because right now it's about us. But yes, sir, I'm looking forward to focusing on Alabama. Carson Beck said all offseason that one of the things that drove him and all that he did was the feeling he had when he walked off the field against Alabama and Atlanta last year in the ACC championship game. We'll see. Feelings don't win you a game. They're not going to lose it for you. Those feelings are what you had to draw from all during the offseason when you were doing all that stuff to get ready for the season. But when it's hard and you, you know, need to make a play, it might be just the thing you need in the moment in a tight game to push a little bit harder to make a play. I don't know. I just think that we know enough about the program, the head coach, and the players in this program to feel confident that when they go on the road for what is undoubtedly a marquee game that is going to have everyone's attention, to believe that they are not going to show up and perform the way they performed against Kentucky last Saturday. Anybody that thinks that team is going to go to Tuscaloosa to play Alabama, you are selling them short and you're showing that you're not really watching this football team over the last few years. But with all that said, what lies ahead, the challenge that they're going to face in Tuscaloosa is unlike anything they faced clearly this season. It's a completely different animal. We just have to hope that they're ready to go. Georgia has a tall task ahead of them heading to Alabama coming off this bye week. They did not play like a team that should be ranked number one, number two, number five last week against Kentucky. But I do not for one second believe that that team is going to be the team that shows up in Tuscaloosa to take on the tide with a nation of college football fans watching next Saturday. Here's hoping for the best. We're all going to find out together. Do we actually know anything about this team or has it all been smoke and mirrors? As far as Alabama's concerned, we'll get into that more next week. Watch this space. I'll keep you abreast of everywhere I'm going to be and everything that we are going to be doing to get ready for that game and the run up to it. So as I said before, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you follow us on the socials because that's how you're going to know where we are and everything that we've got going on. Thank you for being here with me tonight. As always, take care of yourselves. Take care of your friends your families, take care of each other, and go dogs. I told them how about them fucking dogs. That's what I told them. <laughs> <laughs>